All right, we're going to go ahead and get started. Raise your hand if you can hear me. That's my elementary school track that I was at. Uh, I think my teachers always do the peace sign, but I won't, uh, won't argue with that. Uh, well, good morning. That's when you say good morning. Good morning. Well, try again. Ready? Good morning. Good morning. There we are. I am Robin McKay. I'm the CEO of the Cash Campaign of Maryland. Cash stands for Creating Assets, Savings, and Hope. There will be a quiz at the end. Make sure you remember that. I'm really excited to be um, with all of you here. Um, one of this great conversation, but also in my neighborhood. I live right down the street, so um, so welcome to Columbia. It's a lovely, um, lovely community out here. Um, so uh, over the last hour, we've talked really about the different ways that the state invests um, in different things in the state and whether or not they match our priorities. And now we're going to talk a bit more about well, how do we pay for all of that. So we're going to be talking about um, sort of who pays and, and how they're paying on the personal income side as well as on the corporate side. Um, so we have a great panel uh, with us here today. So we have here Jessica Jean Baptiste. Who's our director of tax partnerships at the Cash Campaign? Uh, we have Michael Mazarov, who set our budget policy priorities, and we have Greg Leroy, who did jobs first. Unfortunately, Lawrence um, Dupree, or Graham Dupree, rather, from Leaders of the Beautiful Shr uh, Struggle, couldn't be here unexpectedly this morning. Um, so, we do want to make sure he's going to be talking about fines and fees and how that's another form of taxation. So, we want to make sure that we bring that into the conversation, um, even though he couldn't be with us um, here today. So, we want to make sure to highlight that. Um, during our questions. Um, first, we're going to um, talk about the, the taxes that individuals pay. Um, so, Francesca, we'll start with you. Let me turn you on. So, who pays taxes here? Well, wow. <laughs> okay, great, that's working. Um, so, is there anyone who's a computer's office here? Okay. <laughs> okay, then I think it would be everything you're supposed to. <laughs> But, um, <laughs> but we know that um, working families, families with young children, low-wage workers, youth aging out of foster care, students, immigrants, non-resident aliens, single workers, not having children, we know that over 3 million Marylanders paid taxes in 2017, so that's a pretty big number. Um, and what are some of the ways that our tax system um, impacts income inequality? So traditionally, tax uh, benefits have been skewed uh, more towards higher earning taxpayers, uh, and that was kind of going through uh, owning a large piece of property. So owning a home, um, a lot of the deductions came through paying property taxes, mortgage interest um, rate uh, deductions, but then also some of the other itemized deductions that have to do with taxes as well as charitable contributions. Those are traditionally skewed towards folks that are earning more higher income than low wage workers. Um, and what are some of the changes that we could make at uh, the state level that could bring that back into balance? So one of the things that we could do, and Marilyn has actually done really well, and that was thanks in part to work by the cash campaign and our friends at the center, as well as the other folks that were working in a coalition with us, but it could have been to increase the earning of tax credit. We did a good job last year getting um, low, uh, those low wage workers um, that are under age 25 access to their income tax credit. That means bringing back more funds to about 40,000 Marylanders who are between that age group that will not have access to the state earning income tax credit. Um, lawmakers that just passed the tax credit, the tax credit job act really missed an opportunity by um, kind of ignoring the earning tax credit. We could have definitely seen some increase to that. We already know that this is the, the largest federal income poverty tool there is, and it works really, really well, and it's already lifting millions of people out of poverty, including millions of children. Um, but unfortunately, that was uh, ignored in this new tax bill. Um, additionally, we could have done some better work, I think, with the child tax credit. Um, right now, uh, immigrants and our folks with ITINs, or individual taxpayer identification numbers, are going to be out of getting access to the child tax credit because the new requirements for that um, will require a social security number for children. So, if we could uh, step some of that up, that would be great. 
So, uh, you know, on your last point, we heard it um, a bit earlier, is that there's this narrative out there that people who are undocumented aren't paying taxes. And so, in, in your experience, what do you see? We actually know that's not true. There are a lot of folks that are undocumented that are paying taxes. Um, a few years ago, Maryland um, passed a law that allowed um, immigrants or non-resident aliens to receive access to a driver's license or a state ID. They would come in and uh, have about three years of taxes filed. So that brought a lot of folks into our tax system. Um, we know that there are a ton of folks. I um, think it's around. It's a pretty big number, actually. I have the numbers off the top of my head. Maybe someone here has it, but. <laughs> Shake your head. Okay, I don't know. Um, but we know that when, especially at our tax sites, so we, um, the cash company, provides free tax preparation to folks that earn under fifty-five thousand dollars a year now. Um, and we, our actual collective, um, we did about twenty-two, twenty-three thousand actually tax returns. Um, we know that we see quite a few people that don't have um, social security numbers. These are folks that have high tax. Um, individual taxpayer identification numbers, and they are paying their taxes. They want to be a part of the system, and they want to show that they care, that they care, and that they want to pay into Social Security and all of that um, to show that they want to be in this country. Great. And so, to the point earlier about um, you know where we're investing, particularly around corrections, and then there's this gap in women and girls, um, and the disparities that are created in our budget. We're seeing the same disparities in our tax code. So for these single workers who are eligible for the teeniest amount of our own income tax credit. So families with kids um, can get uh, up to about $6,000 at the federal level, and then 28% um, of that. Well, for the six, these single workers, they were getting an average of $71. And for a single worker, this could mean somebody that is caring for a child, um, but is a non-custodial parent. It could mean a youth that's transitioning out of foster care, or just a young worker that's on their own. So for these folks, they were actually uh, being taxed further into poverty. They were paying a higher share of their income to taxes than higher income folks. And so um, when we're looking at all of the drains on people that have limited incomes, this is a way that our tax code um, is perpetuating a lot of inequality. And so uh, changing the earning income tax credit, obviously one, um, but also making sure that you know folks who are paying in, uh, as we were saying, in our tax sites, um, you know, we see a lot of people with high tenants, and a super majority of those folks vote. They're because they're not eligible for any of these tax credits, and they're still they're getting on payment plans, and they are and they're paying that because they know that that's part of what they want to be doing here in this country is paying into the tax system. And so much what we do when we're trying to get people uh, their taxes right is their back taxes, because now not only are people is our tax code uh, unequal. Um, but also the way that we use the tax code. So I don't know, Francesca, if you could talk a little bit about what we're seeing now about so much that gets tied to a tax refund um, and how, how it's getting held and impacting people's ability to work. Yeah, so um, if folks have outstanding tax liability, you can't renew your driver's license, you can't renew your, uh, your motor vehicle registration, and we already know how transportation is a big issue for folks, and so if you can't even drive your car because your license is suspended, or your professional license actually can also be suspended in Maryland, if you owe back taxes, that's also a significant problem. And so then, you know, this is where, um, you know, these sort of fines and fees starts to come in, right? Is that all of the impact that, you know, people that are under are done with limited income, that there are all of these different, uh, different payments that they're required to. And when you have a government payment, that's very different, right, than, than a personal debt. You know, if you have a credit card, you know, the government has the maximum amount of tools to garnish your wages to not renew your occupational license to you know to your driver's license. Yeah, they can also hold your refund. Um, you know, your state they can apply to get your they can automatically take your federal refund. Um, but they can also apply to take your state refund um, if you you know again are in compliance. And so we're seeing an uptick in a lot of folks coming to us in order to um, get their back taxes prepared. Um, I don't know if anybody knows, but the Internal Revenue Service no longer prepares taxes. You know. Tax authority doesn't do that. So, um, you know, we also know that you know places like Eastern Mark Block and Liberty Taxes are charging about two hundred dollars a pop for folks to get their taxes done. So, when you're thinking about someone who hasn't done their taxes in you know three years, that's six hundred dollars already just to get the documents prepared, and that's on top of what they owe, you know, what whatever they you know had to pay, including you know interest and penalties that accrue daily. 
And so when we get to the q and I would love to hear from folks too, um, you know, on the angle of the different fines and fees people pay in terms of restitution, child support, you know, payments that you have to make as being, um, you know, part of the criminal justice system. You know, all of that are additional taxes and those are additional fines and fees really that are very much disproportionate um, for people of color and particularly for black males. And so it's really important that we take a, a really broad view when we think about um, the disparities that are in the income tax code, but also all of these other government payments and fines and fees. Um, so hopefully we can get into that in the Q&A. So oh, and just, you know, one more thing just thinking about um, the CCJ, just, you know, it's going to repeal the, um, the individual mandate. So as we've been talking a lot about healthcare and Medicaid, um, that is really going to be another thing that's going to impact a lot of folks. You know, we get saw millions of people, millions more people getting access to health insurance and, you know, making it more affordable. But without that, um, you know, that's just going to drive up a lot of the insurance rates. Um, and a lot more people are going to fall out of the healthcare system. And so when we think about preventative care, um, people are not going to have access to that. And so medical bills, we also know how big medical debt is becoming in the country. It's just going to exacerbate a lot of things for folks who are already at very limited income. So when we're on the, the individual side of uh, the tax code, which is voluntary, which is a funny way to describe it, uh, that it's a voluntary system, but it's a system that is that requires compliance, right? Because you can't pay for any of these priorities if people don't file their taxes. And the more barriers that we put in place for costs, for um, for fees, for all of these things means that people are going to, or, or the fear, as we're seeing right now, particularly um, in the immigrant community, that's going to make people less compliant, which means less money into the system. So the state actually has, uh, I think, a really important imperative to make sure that we build a tax code that is more equitable and, and it's more accessible, because the state, frankly, needs the revenue and needs those tax dollars, and the folks that we all take care of about um, are the ones that are paying a higher share. Um, even though it might not be the raw dollar, the highest amount is the highest amount in terms of their income. Um, so I want to um, segue from the individual side um, over to the corporate side. Um, so, so Mike and Craig, can you talk about some of the ways our tax systems create advantages for different sorts of businesses? Sure, I'll start. <clears throat> so I think really the, the critical issue in looking at sort of corporate tax policy in the states, the, the, the key distinction you want to make is between corporations or businesses that are doing all of their business in the state, they're doing all their production in Maryland, and, their, and all of their sales in Maryland. They may be, a, for example, they might be a supplier to another uh, company. Um, and you want to make a distinction between that kind of company and us as individuals as well, and really contrast that with the situation of multi-state corporations uh, are in, in, in states generally and in Maryland in particular. If you're a company that's doing all of your business in the state, or if you're an individual, like even if you're someone who lives in Maryland, but maybe you, you work part-time in Maryland, part-time in Delaware, part-time in Pennsylvania, the rules are set up that you're going to pay tax on 100% of your income. But that's not how it works in multi-state corporations, unfortunately. Multi-state corporations have numerous ways of ensuring that a big chunk of their profits never gets taxed, not only by Maryland, or but in fact, indeed, anywhere in the country. We call this phenomenon nowhere income, profit that isn't taxed by any state, even though it's earned somewhere in some states. And there are a number of things that uh, cause this to happen. Perhaps the biggest is a change that was made in Maryland's law. Maryland was one of the first states to do this back in 2001 under the Bundemic administration, Maryland changed the way it taxed multi-state corporations so that they would only be taxed in proportion to their sales to customers in Maryland. Prior to that, they were taxed in proportion to both their activity in Maryland, as measured by their, their employees and the property in Maryland, and their sales in, in, in wherever they were located. So the implication of that, of that change now, for example, at the extreme, is that if you're a Maryland manufacturer and all of your um, sales are to customers in other states, under the law, law as it was changed in 2001, you now pay no corporate income tax to Maryland, not a single penny. And incidentally, um, that is, is that in the case of if, if uh, Maryland were to get the Amazon headquarters, 
the Amazon, as a result of locating that headquarters in Maryland, would not pay a single additional penny of corporate income tax to the state because on the assumption that the fact that we're getting their headquarters doesn't change how much you and I buy from Amazon, they're only taxed in proportion to their sales in the state. So Greg just told us that we're not going to get any individual income tax revenue from all of its employees, and now I'm telling you we're not going to get any additional corporate income tax revenue. Um, from there, um, uh, from, from Amazon, if they located in Maryland. So that's a really, um, that's really a serious problem. Now, um, you know, some people might argue, well, all right, if we're not, okay, so we're given, we, in 2001, we decided to give up our ability to tax multi-state corporations that were producing here but selling out of state, but doesn't that mean that um, out-of-state corporations uh, that are selling a lot into our state um, are now going to, but maybe we're doing all the production out of the state, are now going to pay a lot more. You know, so doesn't it all sort of come out of the wash? Don't we care about that? And I, well, why did you, you know, is it really as big a problem as I just painted? Well, it is a big problem because um, actually no one knows this other than one like Greg and me, but Congress, way back in the late 1950s, passed a law that said that states can't impose their corporate income taxes on corporations, at least corporations that are selling physical products in the state, like Amazon, can tax um, uh, corporations whose only activity is making sales into the state. And there are lots and lots and lots of corporations um, who basically, uh, that's, they're not producing in Maryland, um, but they're selling lots of, lots of stuff into Maryland. And, um, and the, the law basically allows those kinds of corporations to come into the state, <coughs> make, um, come into the state, visit, actually visit, you know, retail stores and say, how much of my product do you want to buy this month? And come into the state repeatedly to do that, and yet those corporations, because of this federal law, cannot be subject to Maryland's corporate income tax. Now, there are things that states do to counter this. Um, for example, a uh, majority of states have a law that say that if you're a corporation um, uh, that, is, that uh, is selling out of state, but you're not taxable in that other state because of this federal law that I just mentioned, then we're going to deem those sales to be taxable, the profits on those sales to be taxable in Maryland. Um, but Maryland doesn't have such a, such a rule in effect. And according to the last estimate that the state did, um, Maryland is losing $50 million a year in corporate income tax revenue um, by virtue of its choice not to have that so called throwback law into effect. Um, and uh, uh, so I'll, I'll stop there and we'll get into other approaches for solving this problem. You know, a ways down the road. But the critical thing, um, the, the critical thing to know is that multi-state corporations have a whole bunch of opportunities to avoid paying their fair share of corporate income tax. And you, as a, you know, we as individuals in that fully in-state, particularly small don't have. What he said. <laughs> Everybody really needs to understand this because it's so important and just. So easily fixable, even a reverse what's called a single sales factor in the 2001 law that happened during the pandemic. The state could enact and provide reporting and fix a big chunk of the revenue and solve this problem and, and establish fairness between in state businesses versus multi state businesses. This is a fairness issue at the core. Another way that it plays out is on incentives, which is what we focus on in the first. I don't know if I have the ability to get a couple of slides up here. But um, does anybody here belong? So, so for example, here's a problem, right? We've got 20 places that are finalists right now for the Amazon Second Headquarters project, right? Perhaps as many as 50,000 people, the company says. Yet we know very little about the bids that were made in all the two of the 20 places, including Montgomery County. So when the county responded to a freedom of information request, here's the first page laid out. It's a, it's a page turner, and it goes on and on and on. Like that's that's the whole thing, right? So we don't know. Uh, 
what the deal is. We, we know some about the deal because of the special enactment that happened in Annapolis. And again, 4.9 billion out of the 8.5 billion consists of a payment that the state will make to Amazon in the amount of five and three quarters percent of every dollar paid in wages to HP2 employees. 5.75 percent is the top marginal rate for personal income taxes in the state of Maryland. You have to earn a quarter of a million dollars a year to get to that rate, right? So actually, they're going to get paid at a higher rate than the vast majority of those people who are going to get paid. Most of them are going to get paid, are going to have less than a quarter million dollars. They'll make 100 or 150, but not 250. So, so if you want to be diverting an elastic source of revenue from the state, it'll actually be worse than that. It'll be like on steroids, anti-elastic. It, it's an impact on the revenue. Talking about is the, the other structural issue here, right? Is, is it, it, incentives are like the 80% of the budget that the last panel talked about. What it does is it creates a mandated loss of revenue or a mandated diversion of revenue in that case that then becomes unnegotiable and inflexible and crowds out other priorities that you might want to express through the values in your budget, right? That's the structural problem. So, Anybody here from the member of the faith based group here in Howard County called PATH? Anybody here from the PATH group? I used to be. Used to be, okay. So two years ago in this very room, when Howard County was debating whether or not to give a $90 million tax increment financing district or a TIF district to the Howard Hughes Corporation to expand the mall project here. How many people are in Howard County know about this project anyway? A few of you. Okay, great. I did a big tutorial on TIF, and the same structural problem applies, right? So this is a deal in which for 20 or 30 years, I forget the duration, all of the increased property taxes resulting from the redevelopment around this mall here will not go to public services in Howard County. They will be captured and diverted to subsidize the redevelopment of this one little piece of the county, just the new ancillary activities around the county. And one of the points I made at that time was that, um, no, wrong, I think you back, wrong slide. One of the points I made at that time is, betting on retail is incredibly risky, right? Yeah, we have a bloodbath going on in retail today, right? Last year in the United States, 7,000 bricks and mortar stores closed. That was the worst year for retail closures in the United States since the depth of the Great Recession. This year, it's projected to be 10,000. And that's because of the rise of e-commerce, right? And Amazon is exactly half of e-commerce and Wayfair and everybody else comprises the rest of it. So betting on retail is a risky thing right now, right? Why would you double the amount of retail space, which is essentially part and parcel of the TIF deal, right? Another 1.7 million square feet, I believe, in retail space as part of that deal on top of the mall when we're having a bloodbath in retail. And the future of a lot of malls is quite pleasing, right? And White Flint Mall, the dead White Flint Mall in Rockville, Maryland, is the proposed reuse site for the HQ2 bid in Montgomery County because there's only one store left, and they're only there because they had some lawsuit against the landlords. The landlords wanted to toss them out, but the retail wanted to stay for some reason. So retail is a really risky bet right now because of the blood death going on in retail. Instead, Howard County locks in decades of incremental revenue on a risky bet, uh, kind of built, trying to build a wall and a fortress around the mall here for one company. Um, in a way that's going to crowd out its ability to fund everything else it's going to do with all those decades. That's the structural issue here. And the same would apply if the state gives the $8.5 billion to Amazon for the HQ2. All that, no more corporate income tax revenue, no more personal income tax revenue. Um, what's not to dislike about it? Um, let's talk about some of the policy options to address some of this. One, uh, one thing from a couple years ago that um, when we were first actually trying to expand the earned income tax credit eight, uh, three years ago for these single workers, we got caught up in a much bigger tax deal and thrown into that with single sales factor that it was like, you get a tax credit, now let's fix this over here and create this giant package that then fell into pieces. And part of that is because different factions within the business community, right, like some people like the single sales factor, some people don't. So when you talk about what some of the policy options are, can you talk a little bit about sort of like who wants that? What are the, the sort of profile of the businesses that sort of win from that and then who loses? And particularly, obviously, we have an equity right here. So who works for those places and who's benefiting from yeah, well, uh, I mean, the, the, the really key 
uh, policy solution to a lot of the problems I, I identified in terms of corporations being able to avoid paying tax on 100% of their profit. It, the key solution is a policy called uh, combined reporting. And um, this, this map uh, shows uh, which states have and haven't adopted it. Um, you know, you'll see, I mean, the reason why it has not been adopted in Maryland, and we, we've been working for it many, many years, it's, it's incredibly galling to me personally as a Maryland resident um, that I have not succeeded in uh, uh, convincing the legislature to enact what I consider to be just an absolute no-brainer policy in a state that, you know, prides itself on being, you know, uh, politically progressive. Uh, you know, by the um, combined reporting was uh, proposed by Governor O'Malley back in 2007. At some point, I can't remember what year, we managed to get it through the House of Delegates. It's basically been blocked in the, in the Senate in no small part because the uh, about to, or the soon to depart, I think, chair of the uh, Senate, the relevant Senate committee has been adamantly opposed. But, it, you know, it's often a you know, it's any time you talk about closing corporate loopholes, you get a pushback from the business community saying this is this is bad for business or this is an anti-business policy. But you know, you look up here on the, this map. I mean, where are the blue states for the most part? I mean, where are we showing the states with enacted combined reporting? Is it, is it, you know, these are these are most of them are sort of uh, many of them at least are, are traditionally very deep red states. Um, uh, so. Uh, um, Sarah Palin didn't try to get rid of uh, combined reporting in Alaska when, when she was governor and it's enacted in Utah. So this is this is a policy that we just need to keep pushing for. I mean, it is the absolute sort of um, sine qua non of having a robust uh, corporate income tax. So what is, I, I'm talking about that I can even describe what combined reporting is. So forgive me. Combined reporting, very simply, um, is a policy that, that says that we are going to treat corporations that are composed of a parent corporation and subsidiary corporations as one corporation for tax purposes. And we're going to, in figuring out the share of income that uh, Maryland is going to get from any particular corporation, we're going to add together the profits of the parents and the subsidiaries, um, and we're going we're to tax a, a portioned share of that. And as I said, it's, it's, it's apportioned in proportion to sales, so that's a separate policy choice. I mean, we'd like to get rid of that single sales factor um, uh, as policy, but even if we don't get rid of it, combined reporting can, can enable us, could enable Maryland to get a lot more corporate income tax revenue, and I'll give an example of why. So I explained a minute ago that um, Part of the big problem with single sales factor is that we have this federal law that says corporations can't be taxed in the state if the only thing they do in the state is sell products. But there are lots of corporations that have to do, come into a state to do more than sell products. So think, for example, maybe of a company that's making MRI machines in some other state. If you're a hospital buying an MRI machine, you just don't like to get it shit to the loading dock. The company that sells the MRI machine sends in people, they calibrate the machine, they train people on how to use it, they'll come in periodically and repair it. So in, in theory, I mean, they're not protected by this federal law. And so, uh, you know, that's all great. So Maryland, in theory, gets to tax the profit on the sale of that um, MRI machine. But, in, so, but what, is, what, is the, what does the corporation do? It, it keeps the sale of the machine, which is where most of the profit comes from, it's the value of the machine. It keeps that in a corporation, a, a subsidiary corporation, that never enters the state other than to ask the, ho the hospital, are you ready to buy our machine this year? And then all those other activities that I described, calibrating machine training people, they put that in a separate corporation. And that's the corporation that sends people into the state to do all those things. So Maryland gets to tax a little bit of profit of that subsidiary corporation that, um, that isn't protected by this federal law, but the profit on the MRI machine itself, Maryland can't tax because of this federal law. But if Maryland had combined reporting, Maryland would add together the profit of the, 
of the company that's selling the selling machine and the company that's providing these services add together that profit, and they'd be able to tax a, a share of the combined profit of that group. And that's what combined reporting is, and that's why it's such a critical policy because it shuts down all kinds of games like that that enable corporations not to pay their fair share of tax. Okay. Um, so the other big loophole we mentioned were single sales factor and companies like Black and Decker were very active in pushing that at the time even though they then later abandoned Eastman, right? Um, which was a terrible story in itself. Um, I just want to mention there's another connection to our panel and the previous panel and that's having to do with um, nutrition. So um, if you would recall that about uh, 13 years ago there was a wave of revelations in the states about dependence on social safety net programs among Walmart employees, right? About half the states disclosed how many uh, people were on Medicaid or S-chip by employer. And invariably, among those 25 states, Walmart was always number one or two. Obviously, the Medicaid story is a little more complicated now because of the Affordable Care Act, but we still didn't have SNAP data, food stamp data. And we know now in about five states that uh, Amazon is now, <coughs> is now rising in those ranks, right? Amazon is still not the biggest retailer, so now we're way to go, but it's, it's leapfrogging up the ladder. So we know, for example, in the state of Arizona, one out of three Amazon employees is on SNAP. We, and thanks to the Dodd-Frank disclosure laws, we know that the median income of an Amazon employee, which is to say a picker in a warehouse, is $28,400 a year. And the velocity of its impact on wages can't be overstated. Last year, in every quarter, Amazon hired 32,000 people. That's more than Facebook employees altogether. I repeat, every quarter last year, Amazon hired more people than Mark Zuckerberg employees altogether. And they're dragging wages down to logistics and putting people on social safety net programs. Well, and just to underscore, so my dad was a finger at Amazon for a period of time. And my, I think part of those 32,000 doesn't mean that there was 32,000 good paying jobs, right? And so I know for him, he was constantly dealing with uh, the hours because they didn't want to have to pay full time benefits. And so that's something we're seeing, especially with the, um, uh, with the Affordable Care Act, is that people are, they're not getting enough hours. So they need a lot of people in so that they can sort of fill all the tasks. But, I, you know, it would be interesting to see how many people, you know, that's the meeting you said, how many uh, people really are making that 20,000, because I can guarantee that's nowhere near, uh, you know, where they were my dad was making when he was there. Um, uh, so I just I want to pivot a little bit to Michael to talk about the U.S. Supreme Court case. Um, if you want to share, sure. share that and impact on the conversation here. Sure, that, is, that issue I think was, uh, was mentioned earlier. Um, so this is, this is sort of a... Um, a very positive development in the in the realm of, of state tax policy. Uh, you, uh, you may be aware uh, that uh, last month the Supreme Court, in the Wayfair decision, reversed a um, earlier court decisions. One was a 50-year-old decision. One was a 25-year-old decision that uh, that held that states could not require out-of-state corporations to collect their sales taxes um, if the corporation had no physical presence in the state. And unlike what I just described with the corporate tax with the federal law, this wasn't a federal statute. These were federal, these were Supreme Court decisions, and until until Congress positively acted to overturn the decision, which we've been trying to get them to do for 50 years, um, uh, the only other solution was to bring the the case back to the Supreme Court and get the Supreme Court to re reverse its own precedence, which was, you know, which is a, in general a very difficult thing to do. But you know, we, we did manage to, um, uh, after a lot of a lot of struggle over a long time, convince you know the court woke up to the economic reality of 2018 and saw what um, what a burgeoning successful sector uh, and electronic commerce was and decided that these precedents. Um, just didn't make sense in the, in the modern world. So, uh, 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 technology. Um, just to back up, the basis of these Supreme Court decisions has always been that it would be an unreasonable, it would have been an unreasonable burden 
uh, on interstate commerce for internet companies or originally these decisions dealt with catalog, and both of the decisions actually dealt with mail order catalog companies, but it would have been an unreasonable burden to expect them with the technology of the day to collect sales tax uh, in every state throughout the country. And so they, they created this sort of protected zone that said that if the company doesn't have a physical presence in the state, they're not required to collect the state sales tax. And so that's why if you shop online, you know some companies you buy from collect the tax, um, some don't. The reason why they're collecting the tax when they are is because they've established some kind of physical presence in there when they have employees in the state or facilities in the state or both. So, so that's the you know that's the good news that um, uh, there's a general government accountability office report that sort of has the most recent state by state numbers and they've estimated that Maryland could collect up to about a quarter billion dollars of additional annual revenue from um, uh, uh, online sales uh, if the court were uh, to do what it, what it ultimately did. So there's a significant potential revenue there. Um, the court of the decision was a little ambiguous as to what conditions state laws might have to meet to um, be assured that the state could collect tax on all the sales. Um, most of those would be conditions that Maryland will not find it difficult to meet, and it may require legislation, um, but, but those, you know, those things won't be a problem, so the court the court ended up in reversing the decision said, you know, pl basically applauded the plaintiff state in the case, which was South Dakota, for saying we're not going to try to impose any back tax liability on these companies. We're just going to change this rule going forward. South Dakota also had a um, uh, had a provision of its law that provided an exemption for very small businesses making out-of-state businesses making only sort of minimal sales in the state. Maryland could easily connect both of those things where indeed the controller could probably just arbitrarily issue guidance saying we're going to do those two things. Um, but the, 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 there is sort of an open question, a more difficult issue about Maryland's ability to get this revenue. Which that one, of the, one of the things that the court applauded about South Dakota's law was that South Dakota was a member of something called the Streamline Sales Sales Tax Agreement, which is an interstate compact among about half the states that is oriented towards simplifying and harmonizing the sales tax rules among the states to make it less burdensome um, for for companies to uh, to uh, collect the tax. And I'm very strongly supportive of the Streamline and I think more states should enter it, but Maryland never entered the agreement um, for reasons that I'm not, I don't know all the details of. I do know that sort of one factor that's always been raised as to why Maryland didn't enact the agreement um, is that Maryland has a very peculiar feature of the sales tax law which says that um, fractional pennies of sales tax liability are always on a purchase are always rounded up to the next highest cent. And that's you said, well that doesn't sound like much. Well apparently, you know, that 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 is that rounding rule basically which is not consistent with what's required under the streamline agreement, that rounding rule supposedly and the numbers I seem to recall is like something like fifty you know, changing the rounding rule to the way you and I know things are supposed to be rounded would cost the state something like fifty million dollars a year. And I think that's the last Number I saw. So it was totally understandable that, you know, with, with no cash on the barrel head, as they say, with respect to any guarantee that Maryland was going to get any additional revenue by, by joining the streamlining agreement, they chose not to not to join it. Now, I mean, if, it is, if that is indeed the only major obstacle now that, you know, it would be well worth losing $50 million a year to pick up $250 million a year. We'll, we'll, We'll see, we'll see whether Maryland will consider joining the agreement and indeed whether the courts courts will start holding that, that states have to be a member of the state market agreement. Um, and very quick, I, I do want to get to audience questions, but one question I want to make sure just so that um, we can be really clear about it. The uh, corporations that are currently benefiting from this, um, from the way our tax system is set up now are mostly owned by white people. Is that a fair statement? Yeah. 
Yeah, we should look at it. Just, just want to make sure we're being really clear about where the benefits for uh, for these tax incentives. Yeah. White people who yeah. don't live in America. Yeah. Right? <laughs> I um, mean, Jeff Bezos lives in Washington State, where there's no state personal income tax, and he owns 17% of Amazon, for example. I just wanted to have a quick Amazon ring. We'll be you know, off Amazon, uh, you know, Debbie Downer today. So, um, although you may have noticed that Amazon now collects sales taxes on some of the sales if you use Amazon, they still don't collect on so called third party sales, that is, companies that use the Amazon platform to sell through it. And that's about half of Amazon sales. They're still thumbing their nose. At the state government side. So a lot of money still missing. But but, you want to this? Yeah. Well, but, um, I'll, I'll talk about this in a second. But, I, but, but what I will say is that this, is, this will be the next big battleground with Amazon. More and more states are going to consider passing laws that require them and other um, so called platform companies like eBay and Etsy to collect the tax on their third party sales. And in fact, in the state, in the two states so far that have passed explicit, you know, water tight laws saying they have to collect tax on their third party sales as well, they are complying with those laws. So not only does Maryland have to make, not only may Maryland have to make certain changes to come into compliance with the wager decision, but there will be other areas of activity that they'll need to, other things they'll need to do to make sure that the third party sales can be. Um, just in you know, just in terms of uh, corporate uh, corporate tax policy and getting corporations to pay their fair share, um, you know, I just, uh, we don't have a lot of data on the um, on the racial uh, breakdown of stock ownership, but the little data that we show uh, that we do have shows that you know, closing corporate loopholes and making corporations pay their fair share of tax and using that revenue to invest in education and other services. Um, you know, it, it's definitely something that will help close the, the racial wealth gap. Uh, uh, that, you know, the data shows, for example, that, that the, you know, the share of households that own any corporate stock at all is um, vastly disparate in, uh, in terms of white families versus um, households of color. And even when um, households of color do own uh, corporate stock, the, the, the value of that corporate stock is vastly uh, disparate again between white households and black and Hispanic households. So, um, closing, uh, making corporations pay their fair share of that helps close the, the racial. And we're starting to see, see that in small, play out in small business ownership too, which we see on just a few saving that I just will be seeing with us. Uh, so um, well, actually, I was going to ask these guys questions, but sure. Um, so we do see a lot of small businesses. Um, we see a lot of Uber drivers because those are small businesses. Um, also, folks that um, you know sell their wares on Etsy and eBay, um, and you know the amount of money that those folks are making is under twenty thousand dollars. I mean, most most folks are earning between eight and ten thousand dollars um, as part of their what we would call their side hustle. Um, <laughs> what they're doing to make ends meet, and then see when they are able to you know settle down what they need for their wages. But I did have a question for you guys, um, or do, do you want to go to <laughs> um, So what do you guys think about um, the QBI and the qualified business judgment, the new 20%, and how that's going to affect um, and, or anything? Well, uh, this is a special tax break that was included in the uh, federal tax reform bill that basically allows people who earn um, income from, from so, you know, so-called pass-through businesses like S corporations and partnerships to basically only be subject for, uh, on, uh, at the federal level um, on 80 percent of their profit from the business rather than 100 percent. I mean, we um, we are really uh, adamantly uh, opposed to that to that provision and um, uh, because it, you know uh, income. I mean, income is income. There, if you want to help small businesses, there are much more targeted ways of doing it. Um, this, you know, the, the ownership uh, and the profit that comes from pass through businesses is just like corporations radically concentrated at the top. So this is the, this is a huge tax break for very large pass through businesses. Um, the one good, you know, the one good thing that we actually um, were able to achieve, and the, the center was sort of very involved in this. Um, was making sure that, that this 
federal tax break does not flow through to more than only a handful of states, and thankfully, Maryland will Thanks. And I want to take some questions, right? right. I'm just going to come to uh, yeah, I guess this is um, Greg, maybe, and then uh, maybe uh, anybody else can answer them. Um, I'm struck by the Montgomery County is acted uh, <laughs> board. Or, you know, um, if 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 Montgomery County is selected, would that more likely to be open for public inspection? Uh, it would become open for inspection after we got enacted. The question is, would there be any new county enactments that would have to be heard and therefore revealed for at least a brief period of time before they were heard and voted on by the county council? Um, so, for example, I've been speaking around the DC area about this. We know, for example, in Arlington that literally by law there, everything can happen in eight days. They could, they could propose all the local tie-ups to whatever the state has secretly offered Amazon, and it would come law eight days later in Arlington County. And I, I don't have any reason to think that Montgomery County is much better, sorry, if, if at all. And then, you know, Apple got a deal in one day worth two hundred million dollars in my for example. And then um, a related question is: once this uh, HQ two deal is done with whoever it's done. With, do you envision that the states that weren't successful, successful I guess in quotes, um, will then be more aggressive in, in uh, moving to, to, to tax? So is, that, is the fact that a lot of states have bids in it sort of holding off any action they might take that would be seen as anti Amazon? Um, so, this, when the public auction was announced last September, it was a very rare event in U.S. history. I've only named five prior events dating back to the 1980s. This has ever happened. Three times by Boeing, once by General Motors, once by Tesla. Um, and, and it's fascinating that come January, when they carried the list down to 20 locations, they tried to, Amazon was very, I think, struck by how much blowback they got by the way the auction was conducted between September and January. And they tried to put the toothpaste back in the tube. They try to go secretly they announce that the, the rest of the negotiations and the rest of the process is going to be undercover. No press coverage of site visits, non disclosure agreements applied to the RFP. We had nobody to see the second round of RFP. NDAs attached to the 20 bids. Um, there have been just minor press release after the site releases, the site visits happen, and minor press releases about the fact that the next shoe is about to drop within the next few weeks. Um, but within the profession, I, I was on the dais with 500 state local government officials in January, and the buzz there was like, oh my god, I can't stand all this scrutiny. We're so used to operating in the dark. People are looking over our shoulder. People are questioning how this whole sausage gets made. Is this going to become the new norm? People were like really freaked out in the profession. And I had to say that I don't think so. I mean, I think there's a few companies that are really good at hurting media, like Tesla and uh, Amazon, who can get away with it because their current media is so over with their business plan. And look, look at what they got between September and January. Despite the blowback, they also got you know 238 sets of funding politicians sending them love letters for four months. You had a slide change from the Air Kansas City buying a thousand things on Amazon and writing a reviews that consisted of ad copy for Kansas City. I mean, you can't buy that kind of public relations. Uh, I have a question. Uh, earlier this week, uh, there's a political candidate that uh, uh, had an article in the Baltimore Sun where he went to feed uh, hungry children in schools, so it's about school breakfast. And uh, there's a lot of backlash from uh, uh, not members of the political party that he was running as, but from the opposite of the party, saying, oh, well, uh, you know, how are we going to pay for these things? Maryland, you know, Maryland we're a high tax state. Uh, uh, how do we account for the attrition of people moving out of Maryland into other states? And that got me wondering um, about this idea that Maryland is a high tax state. And uh, I mean, I got curious to sort of look at tax brackets of other states, um, about the key states plus uh, Puerto Rico and uh, DC. Sort of look at income taxes, sales tax rates, comparing 
Maryland, Maryland, Maryland stands um, compared to other states. Um, sales tax, property tax. So, you know, income tax and sales, sales tax is pretty straightforward. You can just kind of just sort it. Um, income tax gets a little more complicated. Once you get a property tax, it gets very complicated. Uh, so, what, what are the like, studies? What's the idea? Like, how does Maryland compare to other states when it comes to whatever middle tax state or high tax state goes you know? All right, so there's a slide here um, from the Tax Policy Center. That's the Urban Brookings Center. The other resource I would recommend that gets into the question, the disaggregated questions you just asked, is the is ITEP. I won't even explain the name of the thing. ITEP.org, which is this uh, C3 Associated with Citizens for Tax Justice. They produce a study every couple of years called Who Pays, where they distribute by income brackets the state's entire tax code, income, property, and consumption taxes, all in one place. So you can compare, you can crunch, you can look up lots of studies in reference to Michael's scholarship on corporate taxes. You can look at a Maryland specific page and all the stuff they put out about Maryland. We call it itep.org. We also put out uh, Maryland versions of that data as it comes when it comes out. They they provide the national data in 50 states and we put it into a Maryland conference as well. So you can find some of that information on our website. Um, yeah, it's all, it's all and, and I just would also throw up this um, slide as well, which I was going to use for the afternoon, but um, the business taxes are a smaller share of Maryland's economy than in most of those states. 4.6% of the national average, 3.8% is Maryland's average. Um, so I have a question of Ken McRae. Um, thank you, panelists, for such an informative panel. But um, specifically going back to the tax incentives that you were talking about in the mandate. So if I were talking to someone that wanted to play devil's advocate against with tax incentives um, for these large corporations, what's the kind of return that people that are in favor of these incentives say, for example? These incentives bring back to the state of Maryland by these large multi state corporate investment in Maryland. And what's the counter to that? Sure. Well, I mean, obviously, they try to mix uh, sort of uh, cost apples with benefit oranges. Right? They'll, they'll tell you, think of the jobs, think of the payroll, think of the ripple effects, which are very tricky to calculate. But when you calculate tax breaks out versus things that aren't tax breaks in, you're, you've gone into crazy land right there. That's the most common thing they do, right? I'll just give you one other factoid. And this is, a, this is the dirty, big secret of economic development incentives. They don't work because they can't, because they're too small. And here's why. If you look at all the things companies spend money on, that is their cost structure, right? And obviously they compare cost structures in different places when they're deciding where to invest. The share of that cost structure that consists of all state and local taxes combined equals 1.8% of that cost structure. The other 98.2% of the cost structure is what almost always determines where they go. Labor, occupancy, raw materials, inputs, CEO bonuses. You know, the, the numbers vary a lot depending on the nature of the company and the facility. But state and local taxes are like pocket lint in the decision. They can't make the, the decision. Please uh, someone tweet that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So that's that's why they don't work. The trouble is we've evolved the system, a corporate dominated tax location system that I explained in two chapters of my book. You can read it online through our website. That, that um, where a system has evolved where people make a great deal of money playing states against each other, putting public officials in so-called prisoners to let them whip them against each other to throw money at deals, even though it doesn't make a difference. Because a lot of people's credit gets covered by this subsidy industrial complex. All right, I want to close out our, our panel just with um, my own summary, which is that it, you know, from this panel about who pays, so we know that, um, you know, from, from what we see, people that are lower income, that are disproportionately people of color, are paying more. They're off more of a percentage of their income. They're also paying more in terms of uh, the fines and fees from, you know, all sorts of different types of government debt. So they're having to stretch more with less. 
in terms of who's paying on the corporate side, right? A lot of this money is actually going out of the state um, to, to rich white business owners. Um, and so, you know, when we're trying to get people excited about budget advocacy and why you should pay for the afternoon, that's why. Um, I think taxes are exciting. Maybe I'm a weirdo, but these are my people. Um, and you know, and the, the budget is exciting because again, this is where our priorities are. And so, if we want to fix that system, if we want to throw it out and say, what do, what is our priorities and how do we make a system that looks like it? Then we need you at the table. So I hope you can stay for the afternoon. Um, so first, let's thank the panel. So if people can grab food and come back to the table, we're going to reconvene in a few minutes for our, our keynote conversation. Great. Thank you. Appreciate it.